Hi, this is Alexander Scott, a member of LANS, presenting this week's edition of our updates. Before we begin, a reminder to please visit our website at jalands.org to view more party material, or follow us on social media. Our Twitter handle is at LANS underscore JA. First, we will begin by looking at the recent standoff between alleged members of the Jamaica Constabulary Force, the JCF, and members of the Maroon community. On Tuesday the 10th of August, the video emerged of what appeared to be members of the police force, the JCF, engaged in a standoff with members of the Maroon community. In this video, we see the alleged police officers brandishing guns and apparently engaged in an operation to destroy ganja being grown by the Maroons. We also see where the Maroon chief, Chief Curry, while calming down the situation and reaffirming Maroon authority over the area where the police were, um, was seen with a weapon. The apparent possession of a weapon by the chief has resulted in an investigation by the Firearms Licensing Agency and the issue surrounding the alleged ganja eradication program and investigating and checking out if the men were even police officers or not is now being investigated by the police high command. Now, this, this incident, along with the alleged abuse against Nzinga King by the JCF, I feel tells us two things. First, that we have no real respect or love for our culture or our indigenous people. In case we've forgotten or didn't know, the Maroon community, the Maroons, are recognized as Jamaica's indigenous community. They're our indigenous people. And the Maroon community have for centuries been home to and intermarried with the, the Taino community, what most people would consider Jamaica's indigenous community. We have a real sense of self-loathing and and it, it, it shows itself in how we interact with members of our society who have made a conscious decision and a determined effort to retain their African culture and their heritage. Secondly, though, it highlights how badly we need to break away from the, the the nominal British rule which are currently under. That is where we have the Governor General representing the Queen and the need to craft our own constitution in order to deal with our own problems. A big reason why we are where we are today in this issue, apart from the, the, the drive to access the minerals currently in the Maroon territory is because there has been nothing concretely agreed to in the Jamaican constitution as it relates to the Maroons and the Maroon Treaty. It is a gray area where legal scholars on both sides of the argument have a pretty good case. For this, which is only the most recent and and other reasons, we must break with the crown in a, in a formal way and have the people decide on what is in their constitution. We need to get rid of the governor general and draft our own constitution. And within that constitution, it needs to be reflected that that we are a majority African descended country. You know, we, we the majority of us have descended from African people, from slaves. We we need to show that appreciation and that honoring of that culture in any new constitution. And that new constitution, again, can only come through a referendum. And if we're gonna have a referendum, it, it it has to begin with breaking with the the current rules of the game, which see us nominally beholden to the, the, the British crown. Next, we move on to an article from the Jamaica Observer titled Vaccine Incentives. And in this article, the health minister, Dr. Christopher Tufton, noted that 
while the state does not currently have either the cash or the land to provide as incentives to citizens to get vaccinated as is being done in other countries, he is hoping that the private sector will be able to step in and fill that role of offering incentives to persons to get vaccinated. The minister stated that incentives which could be offered in order to get people to take up vaccines um, as the vaccination program begins its community rollout uh, segment are things such as grocery and gas vouchers. Now, what the minister is calling for is good. The private sector, with its vested interest in having workers and purchases of their goods healthy, should be using every incentive in their arsenal to get persons to be vaccinated. And this is not, not to mention the fact that with COVID affecting so many persons financially, any incentive to go a long way to alleviate the hardship currently being faced in the country. Now, it is debatable as to whether the state could do more to offer incentives. We understand that the money and the land and so on may not be there to cover the entire population, but it's very suspect that nothing, or at least nothing of note, has been done to incentivize state workers, see teachers, nurses, doctors, police officers, etc., in order to be vaccinated. Along with incentives, though, more sensitization programs are needed. The people must be educated about this virus, and this education must come from sources which the people trust, and that means not the politicians. Without the trust and buy-in from the people, no incentive program is going to have any effect. It's not going to work. It's not going to work in having the majority vaccinated and therefore it's going to leave the country and the people of the country in in a precarious situation where we're always facing some type of lockdown or some economic calamity due to not everybody being protected against this thing. Finally, we end with foreign affairs and the recent protests in three Caribbean countries. Between the days of the 5th of August to the 8th of August, the Caracol member nations of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Barbados, and Antigua and Barbuda experienced what were termed as, quote, anti-vaccination protests, unquote. The protests in St. Vincent, this is the one which began first, resulted in a level of violence that saw Prime Minister Ralph Gonzales being hit in the head by a protester and saw the Prime Minister suffering a wound that that saw him bleeding and him needing hospitalization. The, the, the protester who assaulted the Prime Minister has since been arrested. The protests in St. Vincent were encouraged and led by members of the political opposition in St. Vincent, who, during the protests, were calling for an early election, and this was noted in an article by Barbados Today. The protests in Barbados now, this is the second of the protests, was more peaceful, but they were again led by the opposition political parties in Barbados, who had the crowd chanting against, um, and I quote, authoritarian, unquote, government. Finally, um, Antigua, this is the most recent set of protests. Um, this is the third country which experienced protests. Antigua experienced a set of protests which took a somewhat ruckus turn and resulted in the police having to use tear gas to disperse the, the protesters. Again, the protests compri comprised of anti-vaccination campaigners being led by the political opposition of Antigua. Now, the protests in these three countries, at this time in particular, seems very suspicious and it needs to be monitored. It shouldn't be lost on any of us that these three countries, um, they're, they're vocal opponents to the United States imperialism, imperialism in the region, and they've been standing with Venezuela and most recently have threatened to boycott the OAS if they went ahead with a proposed meeting to discuss Cuba. Um, Antigua and Barbuda as the head of Caricom would have led that, 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 that threat. Now, yes, 
people in these three countries are experiencing difficulties. But as Ronald Sanders, an Antiguan diplomat, has noted, the question which remains to be answered is why these three countries in particular, as opposed to, say, Jamaica or Guyana, who are also experiencing economic hardship from COVID and quite frankly have a sizable anti-vax movement. And more pertinently, who is funding the protesters and the opposition parties? As the United States continues to try and maintain its dominance in the region through force and subterfuge, we in the Caribbean must keep front in our mind the fact that we ourselves are not immune from U.S. interference. Now, it's too early to say with any confidence that these protests are U.S.-sponsored or U.S.-supported, but their goals, that is, regime change and the disrupting of daily lives of the citizens in countries that, that oppose United States actions, line up exactly with U.S. interests. And, and these protests need to be watched closely so that they do not become a tool for, for further U.S. intervention and subterfuge in the region. Once again, you've been listening to Lands Weekly Updates. This is Alexander Scott.